Hi everyone, this is Katie Shorey with Songwriters Vantage here at the ASCAP Expo 2011. Sitting with the one and only ASCAP rock star in the house, Desmond Child. Um, 70 top 40 hits, what, 300 million records sold, Grammy, Grammy Award winner, and been recently inducted into the Songwriters Hall of Fame. Congratulations. So, Desmond Child, we present to you, and uh, you've been here working at the Expo, and as you seem to have quite a lovely marriage going on with ASCAP, you're, you do a lot of um, things to be involved with the songwriters. You've been conducting your master class, which has been really wonderful. So welcome, and uh, how's it been going? Have you been having a good time? I've had a marvelous time. I, I, I've been asked to do master classes, and this time what we did was instead of doing a one big show like I, I've done before in the past, we restricted it to 20 people for three days in a row. So there was a big question as to how those people should be selected. And uh, it, was, it was like, well, should they submit songs and then we'll decide who's the most talented and would get the most out of it? It was like all these kind of crazy thoughts. And I said, no, first come, first serve, because it's the, it's, it's the ones that really want it, they're going to get in there first. And so I, th I think it worked out. Because everybody, uh, we went around the room and everybody seemed to have something going on. Mm -hmm. And some, e almost everyone said, well, I got a song in a movie or I'm working on this. I'm just putting out my first album. This is my third album. And, uh, it, you know, it, it was a wonderful group of people. It seems like really the whole, the, the, the halls are filled with talented people. It just seems that everyone is, the ex ASCAP Expo is really important and, you know, um, it's just nice. You're kind of elbow to elbow with all these really creative people who are making it happen. So, um, we just love seeing you all the time here. So to any of you, to a few of you who may not know, you know, exactly who you are. I mean, hits I could list for days, um, living on a prayer, Bon Jovi, you give love a bad name. I mean, you're known for your work with kiss and you want to, you know, what we know of you and part of your bio is that you kind of started working with Paul Stanley. He had heard you. Playing somewhere, or you want to tell that story? I went to go to school in New York City at NYU, and on weekends and weeknights and skipping school, too, uh, I put together a group called Desmond Child and Rouge, and I sang with three gorgeous women and that had wonderful harmonies, and uh, we were doing a kind of fusion of rock and pop and Latin music and cabaret and and uh, disco, and we kind of put it all together in a kind of special kind of music. And uh, that's how we started playing the circuit. And Paul Stanley became a fan of our groups because we started having a lot of good press and lines around the block, fights, cops coming up, arrests. We, you know, it was, it was getting crazy. He asked me if I would write a song with him. So we got together, right, the very first time we got together, we wrote, I Was Made For Loving You. And so we hit it out of the park right off the bat. I guess. And it also began a kind of career that really hadn't existed before, which was the career of the roving songwriter that goes and works with different bands. Bands hardly wrote with outside writers. The, the maximum would be maybe the producer might get a chance, but even that was a no-no. And so I was kind of trailblazing in that way. And because of Kiss, John Bon Jovi loved, loved a song we had written called Heaven's on Fire. And uh, they were opening for Kiss in Europe, and he got um, my number from Paul. And then we... The very first day we got together, we wrote You Give Love a Bad Name, and the next song we wrote was Living on a Prayer. It's not fair. That's all I was going to say. Back to you. No, um, <laughs> wow. Okay, well, continue your story. I mean, I was just joking. I mean, really, it's just not fair. But obviously, you already had the creative genius within you. So, I mean, did you start doing music as a kid? I mean, you were talking off camera about all these festivals you were at when you were you know, a teenager. And it, did that obviously influence your songwriting? And how did that start? 
I came of age in the 60s. All of my friends were going to rock festivals, and I lived in Florida, and so we were lucky to have some big festivals happen down there. For the most part, no one came to play in Florida because it w the trucking was so expensive. So to go to see shows, sometimes we would have to go up to Atlanta or Washington or fly to New York or something like that. And when you're a little kid, 13, 14, 15, you don't go anywhere. So I, I got very lucky and, and um, met Lisa Wexler, who is the daughter of Jerry Wexler, the, the famous producer from Atlantic Records. And they lived on Miami Beach, and she was a snowbird, and she came down a lot because her dad was pretty much parked in Miami at Criteria Studios, working with Tom Dowd and Amit Erdogan and Arif Mardan. And those guys were always hanging around his house. So I was there, and I was often invited for dinner and listening to them having conversations about how they were creating the music business in their own way and about politics, um, the war in Vietnam, racial politics. And I was fascinated. I was bitten. And um, Lisa was always pulling me away from the table. And, uh, you know, she had heard it all and seen it all, so she was not interested in what those old men had to say, but I was. And so I got very lucky. I was 15 years old, and that really was my entry point. Tom Dowd used to give me rides home back to the projects in, the, in Miami where I actually lived. Had you been playing guitar? I mean, did you let them know, you know that you were already a musician, obviously, right? I mean, Actually, I didn't let them know I had anything to do with music. My mother is a songwriter, and I, could, I can... To this day, I don't play guitar, and I can barely plunk out things on the piano. So I'm more of a Tom, uh, of a top line writer and a lyricist. But I, you know, I do write a lot of, I do write a lot of chords and things, you know, in in my in my fashion. And so I was actually too embarrassed to let them know about that, and I never did use that card. In all those years, I never asked them for a favor. I, I didn't want Lisa to feel like I was friends with her because I wanted to, you know, use her to get in the music business. So I managed anyway. That's very noble and also inspiring, and it goes to show that the proof is in the pudding. And if you write a great song, then there you go. It wasn't noble. It was dumb. Oh. Because imagine how much further I could have gotten. And 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 being a producer now, it's and lots of young kids asking to come and hang out in the studio and all that would have been no problem. It, it was just I didn't have enough self-confidence. The lesson is go for it. <laughs> have pride in yourself. You're, you have something to offer just simply because of your interests and your passion. And that brings something to the table. I would have gotten coffee for those people and did whatever it took to be in those rooms. Imagine all those Aretha records I, did, I didn't witness happen. And I could have. I had the access, but I didn't, I didn't play the card. It was kind of a you know, horrible form of modesty. 